I'm registered dietitian Abby Sharp, and on my new podcast, Bite Back with Abby Sharp, I'll be dismantling the multi billion dollar diet industry that keeps us in a cycle of self loathing and food fear. Join me every Tuesday for expert interviews, engaging conversations, and my signature science and sass to bust myths, correct misinformation, and help you break free from diet culture for good. Listen for free on the Seeker app or wherever you get your podcasts. someone else's movie the original podcast where an actor writer director or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make i'm norm wilner tiff's senior international programmer for canada and this is the other thing i do my guest this week is mark mckinney whom you know from the kids in the hall and superstore and the saddest music in the world and a hundred other things these days mark has his own reality series on ctv mark mckinney needs a hobby and he's got a really fun role as a cranky scientist in Viviano Caldinelli's Scared Shitless, which premiered at Fantasia earlier this summer and makes its Toronto bow this Saturday, November 23rd, at the Blood in the Snow Film Festival. It's a lot of fun, and tickets are still available, and you should check it out. Mark picked Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. George Miller's return to the wasteland he created in the late 1970s, which offers a look at the history of the ferocious warrior played so vividly by Charlize Theron nearly a decade ago in Fury Road, starting with her abduction from the Green Place as a child, when she's played by Al Gale Brown, her life with the blustering warlord Dementis, played by Chris Hemsworth, her escape to the Citadel, where she grows into a young woman, played by Anya Taylor-Joy, and her friendship with the wily Praetorian Jack, played by Tom Burke. Like all of Miller's films, it's a visceral, visionary rendering of a future none of us wants to live in. But this one has a very different perspective than the other Mad Max movies, and a much wider scope. We ended up going to some pretty unexpected places, but I think you'll enjoy the ride. This is someone else's movie. I, uh, first of all, it was the last movie I saw in the theater. So, which is becoming sadly so rare. I mean, I, I hadn't been in maybe since COVID. Is that possible? But I'm, uh, I was here in LA and uh, it was playing at a Plex and I had an afternoon off. So I went and saw it and I'd heard that it was bad, but I thought if I'm going to go see a movie, let's go see something big. So I went to see it and I was blown away. I thought it was fantastic. It bore no resemblance to the reviews that I'd read about it. I thought it was, I thought he was as good as ever about pulling together a story and that, that <laughs> what I like about George Miller, what, what I liked about, um, you know the, the especially the last Mad Max movie, fucking blanking. Which I've Fury seen Road? a bunch. Fury Road, thank you. Fury Road, Furiosa, no clue. Okay, yeah, was you know there's that moment where you racks focus in and suddenly you're looking at a tiny detail in the tooth of the 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 white faced kid who's chasing everybody down the. I just thought, like that's obsessional paint every like pointillist filmmaking and. You know, so I was expecting it to be bloated or to sort of be referencing the previous movies that much. Uh, I thought it was a great I mean, it was broken down chapter and, you know, into chapters, unlike Fury Road. But I thought it was phenomenal. And I thought everyone was was really good in it. Yeah. Uh, and I saw it, though, as a movie going experience, I went to a 15 plex or whatever it is over at Century City here. And there were maybe two people working there. They've now replaced all the ticket take, uh, all the cash seats with just automatic things. And there's right. a scared looking person at the concession stand downstairs. And it's a ghost thing. In fact, when I went in, there were only two other people there for this for the afternoon showing. And so I took a picture of us. I said, like, can I? <laughs> so I have a picture of who I saw Fury Road with. I am like, I'm actually angry with myself. I wasn't able to see it in the theater. I, I, could not carve out the three hours in that in the tiny window of time it was around in IMAX to see it properly, even though it was just up the street from the light box. I was seeing other things and I couldn't like I lose all that time in the spring now. So this movie comes out and I know it's there. And it's the first film of Miller's that I haven't seen in the theater in like 40 years. And it hurts my heart oh, that I missed no. it. Yeah. Because it is glorious. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. He's he is almost 80 years old and he is at somehow the peak of his ability. And and this felt yeah. like, 
as much of a blank check as 3000 years of longing was, uh, which is completely out of character for him, but also this just weird, sad, lovely story about people telling stories to each other. Mm. Um, this felt like a proof, like it almost made Fury Road feel like the proof of concept, right? Like we did that and nobody got killed. So let me do this. Right. Yeah. And that 15 minute section in the middle, the chase scene on, uh, it's symphonic. It's his cutting, his ability to lead Who the audience. Who sustain that? There are, there are really, really rich directors in this town who can't put together, who can't keep the story going and do those little micro, as we learned in improvisation, little advances to keep the thing thrusting forward. And he did it so well. And it, it was a credible story. And it's like, and it just starts with a little girl on a branch reaching for a pair and they're the bikers. And that kicks the whole thing off and you're into it, but it doesn't feel like, you know, are you a vampire? I, you know, and then, whatever it it really it was a well thought out story filmed beautifully i thought yeah. and beautifully cast and the the two oppositional evil figures each had their own weird appeal but were believably like a narcic like this place is very real to me that little that little what is it an oasis the the, the high one you know and the, oh, the citadel, yeah. The detail of spraying yourself with paint and then like nah! You know, getting so like it was just fantastic. Love it. The thing that's run through all the Mad Max films is that the culture is established by the time we get there. And you know, each Mad Max movie takes place over maybe a few days. I realized going yeah. backwards, like this is the first time he has tried He's... to look at how these societies exist and how they function, but also where they come from, what kind of leaders are are rising up. Like, there's a reason Dementis doesn't show up in Fury Road, and it's not the obvious one. Like, he's just. Yeah. He, we get to watch over, and it, and you know, it's a, what a wonderful place to start. A character named Dementis who clearly picked his own name himself and doesn't know what the word means. Yeah, right? Dementis. The brothers too, actually, the brothers of uh, the other character. It's, uh, you know, I can't remember their names, but I remember going, "Whoa, that's." But it's simple. It's like by naming them these things, you just unleash these narrative forces that are easy to see and track in a way without it being ridiculous. You know, I've, what is it called when you name a character too close to what it is? Oh, nominative determinism? Yeah, I don't know. Whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Hanging a lantern? Yes. Hanging a lantern. That's, that's another one of those things that everything in this movie is a lantern, right? Because... Yeah. They're starting from nothing. And and I have been, this is my favorite bit. I have been able to interview Miller and, and sit down with him often enough over like 30 it. years yeah. that he kind of recognizes me now, which is just the greatest yeah. honor. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. he's always said that the Mad Max movies, like his movies are always set 40 years from next Wednesday. Like the apocalypse right. always starts on Wednesday and he just right. tracks forward. And it doesn't really matter because everything is reclaimed technology. There's no computers or anything that would give it a, a date. Right. But with Furiosa, he rolled it back just enough to show us what it looks like in 25 years instead of 40. Like the the cause doesn't matter. The society has collapsed. These are the only people left as far as anybody yeah. knows. And all that matters is gasoline and food and... Gasoline uh, and procreation and clean bloodlines, which yep. is the big part of this. It's like as a little girl, she's ushered into that vault and then she comes back and rescues them. And yeah. Yeah. Get out. Yeah. And by following a woman for the first time all the way through, as opposed to a Max character. Yeah. It is a completely, as you, exactly what you said, it's a totally different perspective right away. She doesn't even have to say or do anything, but we understand that she's receiving this world differently. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. And, and how what, much a, it, what an amazing casting job. Like that. And as, as great as Anya Taylor Joy was, the little girl was like phenomenal. Just phenomenal. Yeah, Alia Brown, who I think I'd seen in one other thing, but yeah, yeah, she's just uh, yeah, she's in one of the Sonic the Hedgehog movies. Of course, we all need to uh, work. <laughs> we need oh to no, I it's um it was an Australian film that I saw last year called Sting about a little girl who takes a an alien spider into her home because she thinks it's a pet, right? And she's really good in that, but this is. Yeah, again, this is what happens when George Miller gets somebody who he can just immediately position in a way that you understand everything and then let them act as well. Yeah, yeah. 
She's yeah. great. And we watch her for what? Like a full, almost a She's, full hour. I, 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 I meant to time it out because I, I wanted to make sure because, uh, you know, Viv was running and said, so what is the movie? And I suggested a few titles. And, oh, Furiosa, because I loved it and I saw it last. So I watched it on the flight back to L.A. a few days ago to just to make sure that I, you know, I wasn't high or something. No, I still loved it. I still love, but you're right. I mean, uh, uh, she's in the movie until what happens? There's the first time we see Anna Taylor Joy. It's when the truck is being suspended, and there's an accident. Somebody has to go down and hook it up, and there she proves her metal right away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And until then, it's a kid. Like it's really through the eyes of a child, and all through the eyes of a child. With some, she shaves her head to put on the fake wig, and the creepy, you know, son is ugh. Anyway, very, very well done. Yeah. yeah and it. it's it's so odd to realize, too, that they kept that from us. Like, it's not in the marketing. It's all on Anya Taylor-Joy's face. And I think that was one of the reasons people didn't uh, accept it as quickly. Like, the early reviews were They like, just wanted Fury Road. They just wanted, oh, it's Fury Road, but, like, it's, now she's, you know, 20 or something. Yeah, or, otter Fury like, Road. Already. But that that part of the plot is so essential how she becomes inveigled or you know captured by this fucked up rivalry and then the rivalry is interesting you know we learn more about you know who runs the refinery and who lives you know who's out in the and just on their motorcycles and how power is exchanged and yeah yeah and it's something that the other films have never had time for they've always been about the chase or about the like building and building and building to the big thing this is easily the longest of the mad max films and it doesn't. It didn't feel like it. It flew by for me. And, and no, it flew by. I just. I'm. In fact, I'm surprised to hear you say that. It's two and a half and hours. Probably helped by the chapter. You know that chapter. Yeah, and I don't. I don't have a huge tolerance for very long. With you have to. You have to earn my hours, especially. You know, now that I'm older. Yeah. No, I. <laughs> yeah. I feel the same way. I just found out how long Wicked Part One is, and it's like, isn't that as long as the show? It. It seems yeah. unnecessary. But yeah, uh, creating the creating the narrative arcs through chapters definitely paces it out. And I think this is the one film too, where it needs to be this long to give us the passage of time to make us understand. Yeah. Yeah. Cause if you just, you know, well, as a lot of other people would have done like accordion, the, the backstory of it wouldn't have, you wouldn't arrive feeling that, you know, the potential of the character, like it needed, she needed to go through all of that in front of us. So, Yeah. Yeah. And and wear it in a way that also everything is already so worn and tattered and terrible that it's harder, I think, to progress a story or progress a story in a, in a way that makes sense for the passage of time. Because he undercranks and he moves so quickly and his cuts are so are so vivid, you you're almost fighting against the idea that there's a calendar as well as an adventure, at yes. least for Miller. I, I I've. It's something we've never talked about, and I'd love to find out how he structures because you know Fury Road was famously just storyboards and minimal right. dialogue, and and everybody just showed up and did it. And Anya Taylor Joy has talked about how lonely and isolated she felt making this movie, and how it was it was worth it, but it was miserable and all this this like he I don't know if Miller I mean I know Miller knows how to direct actors because you can see it, uh, especially in his in his you know more ground level stuff like uh, Lorenzo Zoil, which. Still, you know, I, I will hold up as his masterpiece until the day I die because it's the one film that combines his intensity as a director and his medical background. So he knows exactly how hard to hit you with these things about a parent potentially losing their child. Um, and he got, you know, Susan Sarandon's incredible performance and Nick Nolte, whose accent is actually genuinely correct. He, he took a lot of shit for it at the time, but I met Augusto Odoni and that is what he sounds like. Right. Um, and here... You know, it's it's 30 odd years later, he's focusing on kinetic cinema, but he still has to work with the individual actors to get those close ups. Really, there's no way that's just somebody not knowing what to do. He's shaping performances, but I think maybe he's doing it in a way that no one fully understands just now. There's there's an incredible hour long documentary on the on the um, on the 4K and the Blu-ray discs, and it's just about his process. And he does not appear to have one for the longest time. I would, I would bet, because what I w- recognize is there's an emotional intelligence of how much time he allows you to spend and when he allows you to realize what's going on with the character that mm-hmm. is 
Well, it's part just like, you know, ancient gifted storytelling ability, like to to keep people leaning forward to use that hackneyed phrase, but also the timing of it and the setup. Like, you know, it took me a, a while because I started in comedy, but to realize that drama is the same as comedy in that you have to discreetly set up if you really want a big laugh without the audience knowing you have to set them up for the hammer blow. And he does that exceptionally well in big ways and little ways. And when detail is interesting and when it's superfluous, but you compare his cutting, which is can be which seems fast, but worthwhile with so much other epic big movie cutting, which seems purposeless and distracting and which strips away the feeling and his stuff builds it. And I think that's just basic fascination with the phrase, you know, once upon a time, you know, and then go it's weirdly enough you don't see it in taylor joy as much as you see it in hemsworth right who plays yeah. this impatience and and vanity but at the same time like something that's deeply considered like a poker player who knows his table but who's vain but he's also there's a, there's a there's a there's just enough humanity he doesn't like being called a monster he you know it's it's a real it's a great gumbo yeah good for yeah. him I, yeah, I almost would want to watch a Dementis origin story just like to to see how he oh, figured it I out. I want to know how he wrapped up like that. Yeah, because oh my god, is that satisfying in Fury Road when the mask gets caught in a tire? You know, it all comes out of him. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it, right? Like Miller manages to make every single one of the villains in the Mad Max films is, with the maybe possible exception of the first one of Toe Cutter, just because he is just a generic thug, because uh, the world hasn't completely collapsed yet. But the warlords he creates. Yeah. Um, the humongous in Road Warrior and Anti Entity in in um, Thunderdome, and Immortan Joe and and now Dementis. They're they are they're all performers in a weird way. Like they have mm-hmm. to be because that's the. It's almost. I mean, it's dumb to make this comparison now because Fury Road predates the election by a year. But it's Trumpian, the way Immortan Joe comes out and just spews whatever he needs to see. And then with Dementis, he clearly is thinking about it. Like he is right. promising people that he will be their sole defender and he'll help them and he'll give them everything they want. And some of these things are word for word. And, you know, regrettably, we are recording this a week before the election. So I have no idea how it's going to. I mean, I hope I have hope how, how it's going to turn out. But Miller Trump loves. Is make one of his sons jump off the Brooklyn Bridge, like the sacrifice and the, there was the response. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, Dementis was like, yeah, he's. Uh, yeah, I sort of got vestiges. I was wondering, is this political? But it wasn't so on the nose that I was kind of going, oh, now I got to track this with the New York Times headlines. You know, no, it was just, yeah, this is what fucked up power looks like. Exactly, yeah. he is promising the world to people who don't understand that he can't deliver. I think that's the thing that I was resonating with. And, and and Hemsworth absolutely gets the glee that Trump takes in his bullshit. Like yeah. when he's when he is making his pronouncements and pausing to make sure everybody can applaud to, for him, that's yeah. something that Hemsworth clearly got. And the other thing that I loved about it is the sense that it isn't working, that, that there's always somebody in the room or on the stage or on the platform with him who's just looking askance and going, oh, actually, I don't know that we can do that. And the fact yeah. that he doesn't care and doesn't, because none of, he's never going to have to deliver on any of this stuff. It's always just about staying in power for another hour. Right, right, yeah. And when it all falls yeah. apart at the end, he instantly turns to plead, I can be valuable, I can be useful, like instantly yeah. just debasing himself in front of people who have more power than he is, he, he currently right. has. It's... It explains why this guy could rise while, again, those of us on the other side of the screen get to congratulate ourselves for seeing through him. But I think that's part of the right. fun of the performance. Uh, the peacocking is readable. It's just that right. when he's the only person promising you water and a place to sleep, of course, you're going to listen yeah. to him. Yes, I know. And look what we're look at what we're going through. Like, like what, what is January 6th now? It seems to be a collective amnesia about what actually went on there. Yeah. <sighs> Oh, we could, uh, yeah, two Canadians talking about the America. Okay. I mean, no, I know. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah, he's built these movies that are basically treatises on how, uh, it's not native. Well, I mean, it's nativism with Immortan Joe and, and Dementis, because it, as you said, it is all about the bloodline and, and making sure yeah. the nice pale ladies have nice pale babies, which is so incredibly disturbing that it can't even go there when it's a movie from a woman's perspective. Like he just, he brings us right up to the edge of what's really going on in there. And that's, I think 
anything further. And he's absolutely capable of doing it. I don't doubt that. Yeah, because I love you to... come in and it could be like, is this gotten just soft core porn? And then the very next scene is they haul out a four-legged baby that's a mutant and it's just like, well, you know. It's... Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's, I mean, and that pays off a line from Fury Road, right? I had a brother. Yeah. Which is so yeah. weird and twisted and tortured and makes sense in the moment, but then you realize, like it took him, what, uh, almost 10 years, but he paid it off with this, oh no, that's what's really happening. This is, yeah. there's a reason this isn't working. Yeah. Um, I'm actually haven't watched Fury Road since Furiosa. And I kind of want to go back and see if there are more specific things in there that, that are. I want to link them up too. I want to do, I'm going to do a Miller binge now because this is like kind of a confirmation. Like you have to follow the geniuses and you got to go back and see all their stuff, you know, like with Coen brothers and other favorite, you know, directors uh, or writers. Um, but boy, he's, yeah, he's got a dedicated crew. I know that because uh, uh, B-Cam on Superstore, the operator, was shot Fury Road and loved talking about it and was like, I will go. I will work for that. I will go to Mars to work with him. It's the best fucking experience. You know, and he's very, you know, buff kind of guy. But he was the he was the camera who shot the camera who shot most of the guitar on the <laughs> the pole thing like that was his that was kind of his area of expertise which is like fantastic yeah. and talk about a device oh my god but a madman guitarist with vampire teeth and a fucked up face on a on a bamboo pole and the imagination of you know the ladders as the, the tanker is going you know and you know and then how they have to jump and the and the shot i think the shot that gets me the most if there would have to be it would be uh, uh, Furiosa opening the back panel and seeing the boy man with a bullet through his head sitting in the cabbage. Like him sitting on the cabbage as the chase is going on is just like, like who thinks of that? And who knows that 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 cutting to that in particular makes what's going on even more exciting. Yeah, yeah. it's for me. It's the shot of the war boys coming up one side of the truck up of the of the rig while the other um, yeah. raiders are on the other side and just the shot when it cuts to the wide when it cuts to the profile of the truck and it's just like yeah. this is poetic it is so beautiful to be able to have the confidence in a filmmaker to know that i am seeing exactly what i need to see at any given yeah. moment for both the emotion and the thrill the action of it and yeah the just that incredible mechanical sliding around underneath. It's like he saw the truck chasing Raiders 40 years ago, and he's been trying to figure out how to top it ever since. And this one idea. And, that and he's in. not letting go. And he's won. He has won, as far as I'm concerned. Especially because there's, is there even an homage to Dolly? In Furiosa, towards the end, you see that first shot of the octopusy balloon far off in the background, just just like solid black against a blue sky. And it's like, where have I seen this before? But yeah, there was a melting clock in the foreground the last time I saw a composition like that. And then, of course, that is the final course, is the, you know, finally getting sucked into the, what do they call it? The, the, the rotating balls. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Which, again, yeah. someone had to figure out would be a fun thing to put on a truck for defense. Exactly. A crazy thing, but like from an inspired eight-year-old, from the mind of an, you know, comes this, yeah, comes yeah. this fantastic thing. Yeah. Well, he said with Fury Road, his mandate was that there could be no new technology. It all had to be, everything that everyone used had to be repurposed from something else. Like you could get away yeah. with clothes, shoes, jackets, pants, things like that are, are perpetual. But yeah. He said he uh, like Max is the 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 mask they put on Tom Hardy for about an hour of the film is a garden trowel um, that's just right. strapped yeah. to his head, and it works. Yeah. It serves the purpose. <laughs> but if you look at it and there's all kinds of other stuff, and and with Furiosa, it is like he's trying to show you the beginnings of it, where the engineering comes from. You see moments of inspiration yes. as people develop. No, it literally shows you the class where the guy is doing instructors and saying like, okay, we're going to build something great today. We got all these parts. And we're going to put together an amazing button. There you go. Yeah. You have to teach them, but you have to teach them. And again, it's it's aware of how how totalitarianism works, right? Joe only teaches them what he wants them to know. Right. And in Dementis, you have the opposite version. You have someone who doesn't want to learn, who doesn't care yeah. about things. He just has people for everything. And his advisors are there. And, and that's the thing that the history man says early on. You like, Make yourself useful. Find something that you can do that no one else wants to. 
Right. And in his case, it's tattooing, you know, entire books onto his own body. And in Furiosa's, it's just paying attention. And like she is the the embodiment of what do they what do they say about luck? It's uh, preparation and opportunity at the same moment. Yeah, yeah. She's yeah. just ready, and that is why I think honestly that's why the ending is so strong because she's finally taking her moment. This thing that's coming for two and a half hours that we I I can't imagine there are people in there who don't know what she's about to do. I mean, Fury Road has been around for 10 years and nobody's coming to see. I can't imagine people saw Furiosa cold. But mm. if they did, it still makes sense. Like it still goes out yeah. on a- Because it's about a little girl rising to this 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 pinnacle of through power and opportunity and luck. But it's interesting. I, who's the actor with the uh, uh, with the lip? Who's who's the driver of the, the guild of tanker? And Tom everybody Parker. else has died. And they keep cutting to her looking at him, you know, and then and then he and then he invites her in, and that's like you know she ascends to another level. But that, wow, I just like a good story. Reader's Digest, big screen, I don't care. It's Norm interrupting my own show to bring you up to speed on Shiny Things, my newsletter about physical media, culture, and the odd streaming project. Last week, I wrote about Made in Britain, the films of Powell and Pressburger, and new 4K restorations of Born on the Fourth of July, Drag Me to Hell, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, and The Invasion. There's plenty more to come, so sign up for a 14-day free trial at shiny-things.ghost.io or find the link at the Semcast Blue Sky account. You like reading about movies? I like writing about them. Come check it out. I'm registered dietitian Abby Sharp, and on my new podcast, Bite Back with Abby Sharp, I'll be dismantling the multi billion dollar diet industry that keeps us in a cycle of self loathing and food fear. Join me every Tuesday for expert interviews, engaging conversations, and my signature science and sass to bust myths, correct misinformation, and help you break free from diet culture for good. Listen for free on the Seeker app or wherever you get your podcasts. Had you seen Burke before? I, I'm, I'm guessing no. He's he's a remarkable, dramatic actor. He was like he was. I feel um, like I've seen him in something. Is he in like National Theater Live kind of stuff? Is probably, he yeah. He's done some stage. He's in a bunch of stuff. He was in jo- uh, Joanna Hogg's first souvenir film, which is wonderful. He plays a a loose judgmental heroin user, uh, whose whose charisma is ridiculous. Oh, he played uh, Orson Welles in um, uh, in Fincher's Mank for one scene. Oh, yeah, I saw yeah. that. Yeah. But I know him only as a dramatic actor and, and most recently in a film called Clockenloiter from the actor Neil Maskell, who works with Ben Wheatley a lot. He played a like this sort of um, ambivalent security agent protecting a whistleblower uh, mm-hmm. and getting bored of the job, which it's it's really, it's fun. I have no idea what it, what happened to it. It played, a, it, uh, it opened in London last year, but it's it'll show up somewhere and it'll be really fun. Uh, and here he is, like being a Mad Max guy, being an action hero, and he's so you pull really it off. good at it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, he's really good. He's utterly credible. Everyone is credible. I guess I'm saying, Norm, I like the movie. <laughs> that is what we do here. Going to seeing it in the theater. Yeah. You know? Oh man. Now I'm going to go I'll... back and do all day because I I can't even remember if I saw Lorenzo's Oil when it first came out, but I got to go see that. There's mm. so many movies to see. Yeah. Yeah. That was '92. Um, yeah. I, uh, it was a Christmas release. I, uh, I was writing for the star at the time. And the only reason I ended up reviewing it is because the critic that had gone to see it officially left after an hour. Cause it was too painful. It was too intense. She was a relatively oh, new wow. mom and just couldn't oh. like, and, and, you know, I don't blame her at all. It's, it is an excruciating film. If you're a parent, yeah. um, you're watching these two intelligent, competent, highly capable people watching their child deteriorate from a from an illness that is ultimately one of their faults because it's a genetic disorder and Mm. the movie does not shy away from any of it it just pushes and pushes and pushes into it and it has an upbeat ending but it's wrenching uh i mean like all of miller's films right the journey is torture uh but you if you survive it becomes you know redemptive um and then i ended up having an interview with him over lunch at the Four Seasons, no, the Park Plaza with him and the Adones. And like we sat there for an hour and they were the people that 
Nolte and Sarandon portray. And he mm-hmm. was like, it's ridiculous, isn't it? These are the same people. And he was just so, he's so friendly and so cheerful. And one of the only, how can I put this without sounding like a massive sycophant? One of the only legitimate geniuses I've ever met who is comfortable with talking about process. Like just, he's not afraid of breaking the spell. Yeah, you know who's like that? Guy Madden. Yes. And Viv, too. Viv, uh, Viviana Caldinelli, who I think is on a track. I think like it's it's interesting. I've known him a while, but I I just became, oh yeah, he's actually working in area. And, you know, and Guy Madden likes talking about his stuff. And is maybe one of the funniest people ever. Maybe, yeah. You must have interviewed him. Oh yeah. He's, yeah, he actually, he did the podcast years ago. He picked uh, Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia, which is a really fun episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I just saw him last month at the festival. We did the Q and A for Rumors. Um, yes, me and the John, him, Have you guy seen and it the yet? Johnsons. How is oh it? yeah, it's yeah. it's it is like undeniably their thing. But it's also the first time I think he's tried political satire, and he's really good at it. He's just so broad yeah. and so non-specific. Like his whole point was that he cast actors who kind of look like they could be politicians and then just yeah. lets the brain fill in the blank. Like the audience brings their own stuff to it. Like, I don't think Roy Dupuis is playing Justin Trudeau specifically, yeah. but he's having a really fun time yeah. nodding in little directions. It's kind of like the way Alexander Skarsgård played the Canadian prime minister in um, a Charlize Theron film in, in long shot. And, yeah. um, and doesn't do anything other than just this bright-eyed enthusiasm, and everybody immediately decides that that's the actual prime minister. Uh, Charles Dance plays the president of America with his own accent, and right. it's fine. Kate Blanchett is the chancellor of Germany, and it's just a is it, bunch. Is it black and white? Is it is it uh, is it his his style? Is it retro style or is it modern style? Now? It's a little cleaner. It's color yeah. and and what's the color? No color and muddy. Yeah, but it's color and really, muddy, like muddy, like early Technicolor kind of muddy, or um, more and more like smoke yeah. and fog, and and they've played with it in post production to make it look even even stranger. But the colors when they br- when they burst, there's a shot of Alicia Vikander in a giant brain that's been making the rounds. That's what the movie looks like. It's just big. I can't wait. To Is it going to be released? Will I be able to see it in a the theater? Like there's uh, oh. Elevation released it. I don't know who has it in the states. I want to say Neon, but it might not be. I'm sure it'll open eventually. Yes, but it'll. The thing is, like, it gets three days now. Like, uh, did you see that New York Times article about a month and a half ago? And they were talking about, oh, here's what was it on for a typical weekend in 1999? What you could yeah. see. Do you know the article I'm talking? I about? think I saw it. There's and, been there've been a bunch of movies bemoaning the fact that films don't play for the length that they used to play, or even with the range that I they used know, to play. That they don't go from, oh my god, it's in the big one at the Uptown, but now it's around the corner, uh, you know, at at the Carlton, and you, but you can still see it, and you can see it, you know, in place for four months. I. Oh, I miss that. I know. I really, the worst really thing did. the worst thing streaming ever did was compress the, and it's not even streaming's fault. It was it was DVD, right? It was the theatrical window shrinking because you could press a film and have it out in 3 months instead of 6 or 8. And the the other big problem and this is something that I'm constantly confronted with now that I work on the exhibition side is that people have deluded themselves into believing that you can watch a movie on a big screen at home in almost as good quality. And yeah, you know, the 4K projector is the 4K projector and the screen is the screen, but your relationship to a film is so different in your own home. Even if you, even if you do what I do and turn off, you know, like you put your phone away and you sit and you face the screen and you don't get distracted, you're still at home. It's not the same. There's a, there's a, have you tried, have you tried the Oculus? No, I've heard about people using it to watch movies. Does it actually work? I have, I have an Oculus film club that I started with uh, uh, a couple of friends, and we watch, uh, we try and watch a movie a week. We don't always do it, but we're up to 130 movies, mm-hmm. and it's is it pulls you back. It's not all the way back to cinema, but there is something about the way uh, your eyes receive the information that feels that it's not mm-hmm. television. It's definitely not TV. What do you watch? Um, is there a particular type of film that works? Best? We uh, we take turns. Uh, I'm on. I'm going to do the uh, the trio just because I came across the, uh, uh, the the Quentin Tarantino talking about the only film series or, or triptych that ever worked was you know uh, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, A Few Dollars More, and Once Upon a Time in the West. So I'm working my way through that. Hmm. Uh, and but no, it's it's great because we all have uh, the three of us have completely different tastes. One of us is a 
you know, a microbiologist from Boston, a biotech worker, and another friend that I write with. And yeah, anyway, whatever. It's great. And it's kept me in cinema. And we all follow our little passions and then drop them and come back. And, you know. So maybe I'll make Miller my next one. Go back. I was going to say, I bet those would play. I mean, his his if you get a big enough screen, even if it's virtual, because that's I think that's the thing about a theater that you can have that you cannot have anywhere else, which is physical distance. Like you actually yeah. are that's, far enough that, away from that's the what it does is you're in on big screen, this little app. You can pick uh, a number of theaters. One of them looks a lot like the old uptown. Oh. Uh, it's like very much almost IMAX scale. And then you can be in a car and watching on a drive-in screen. And then you can be in a, you know, but whatever you have this feeling of of separation and there's an app part of the app is that you can uh, have popcorn and throw it around but you can also get tomatoes to throw at the screen which we do if something does not please yeah i was wondering how you handle a virtual reality theater situation yeah it's really it works it works as far as i'm concerned all right yeah i mean i'm really curious to know how a, a miller film would play just because the best of them pick you up and shake you in a way that other films don't and the yeah you you get to feel i mean terry gilliam does it too like you get to feel the pleasure he has the creator has of building the world and running around in it yeah yeah very much oh that's a good that's a very apt comparison yeah gilliam who are the world builders uh oh sorry my my ancient brain uh no. the, the, the secret of water uh was it the toronto director from oh from cameron uh no, no. um Oscar nominated. Can oh, Guillermo, Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro, of course. Yeah, yeah, he's a world builder. Would you say the Cohen brothers are world builders? I think so. I think they I want think to. Yeah, the raising Arizona, definitely. Yeah, or something oh, like the No Country Venice, for Old Men. Venice of, of Lebowski, but that's actually in a world that actually exists. I mean, I literally that is outside my window. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, but they still tweaked it into the long goodbye, right? Like they've turned it into Altman's version of of that vision from the seventies in the present, except that it was twenty years earlier. But but yeah, they're they are playing with they play with texture in a way I think that almost no other American filmmaker does, just because they can't do anything else. I, I love the filmmakers who, no matter what the project is, they are inseparable from their vision and their vision will infect whatever the world is. I mean, it's something like Burn After Reading, which is just the most banal visuals of Washington on purpose, right? Like it is supposed to look like a strip mall and an office building and and a, a crappy house, a brownstone. And they right. somehow turn it into a fun house yeah. because of the way they decorated it or the, or the attention to detail they brought to a serious man where they're rebuilding their childhood basically, and and sort of refusing to acknowledge that it's their childhood because, oh, no, we didn't have these events and we didn't have this character and this, like, obviously the cyclone didn't come and destroy us in 1969. It's like, no, but you were those kids. Right. And they don't want to acknowledge and like, well, there's some similarities. They just, they're so cagey about revealing anything about themselves. And yet they made the most autobiographical thing they ever could have made, you know, about growing up Jewish middle class in, in Minnesota. Right. And, right. um, and they they still have to make it arch and weird and have Richard Kind running around as as the crazed brother, but the details, the clothes, the the bar mitzvah stuff, like that's straight out of their lives. They just won't acknowledge it, right? But they can only make their own kind of movie. That's like even Buster Scruggs, which is as goofy and silly and and weird, still has the same concerns. It's about legacy and death and family and and loneliness and isolation and and the fact that there is no morality. Someone said they're the most moral filmmakers they'd ever seen. And I countered with this like, no, 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 they're about constructing morality. Like right. doing the right thing in their movies is a deeply damaging and horrible task. I mean, you could say the same about Miller, right? Who is who's a righteous filmmaker. He tells stories about heroes emerging from swamps and right. the Coens, i think they're really interested in how the swamp functions yeah <laughs> yeah you get the impression that there's a there's a system of of, uh, of government like particularly in raising arizona that you know the both sides the law and and ethics and pride but like the pride of the criminal and like the code and oh my god fucking john goodman's performance in that yeah and that's the first line of miller's crossing ethics Right. Like that's the first yeah, word yeah. spoken. Yeah. Yeah. By a guy who doesn't have any. Yeah. Which is again, that's their thing, right? Like no wonder Joel made the tragedy of Macbeth. It's 
it's the only story about doing the wrong thing over and over again. That yeah. like it's the original story, I think, almost if unless you count the, the old testament. But the the sense that you can justify anything. That's I think that's their their entire um narrative flow. Uh, Kate and I watched the the Coens. We she still hasn't seen Buster Scruggs, but we watched everything else. And we stalled out uh, over the pandemic and we stalled out at Lewin Davis because she couldn't stand watching someone make the wrong choice over and over and over again. Right. Yeah, Even yeah, though yeah. it's absolutely justifiable, it's it's his character. That is his whole flaw um, that he can't see ahead of like, two two minutes ahead of himself. I know, and he fucks himself. himself. That is really hard because he's a performer. The way he's fucking himself is particularly hard to watch. Is your partner in the arts? Uh, no, she's a teacher. She's a um, she's a math. The, a math grad and she teaches and, and uh, knitting and writes uh, pattern books and knitting books. Whoa. But uh, yeah, again, it is, it's the, yeah. you're making, you're making a mistake. Yeah. It's unforgivable. To I mean, it's something, it was something particularly hard to watch him make that type of mistake. It was almost like watching that. What is that? Uh, uh, Jerry Seinfeld, a doc or the doc about the comedian. Oh, comedian. Yeah. Who goes Adams, the Adams, the other guy. And, oh. Oh, that fucking guy. I've seen him. I met him a dozen times. And you're always like, don't, don't. You're just about to make it. Stop. Just let it happen. Oh, don't get involved. Don't get involved. <laughs> the one thing I keep telling people now when they ask, uh, I'm going to do a panel in Chilliwack, uh, probably the week this comes out, about um, they've asked me to come on and be a guest at their panel at the film festival there about how to get your movie into festivals and how to make movies that people want to see. And the, there is no answer, right? Like the answer is make a movie that you care about. And eventually that will translate to yeah. someone, someone will connect to it. But I do have a quick advisory for people, which is everybody knows the guy who isn't doing it right. Everybody knows one person. They have a friend who who tries too hard or needs it or is too needy right. or is, is convinced there's a secret formula. Just don't be that person. And you right. already have an advantage. I know. And if you need... An example of what that might look like, go see next, uh, wait, wait, uh, Pope of Greenwich Village, Eric mm -hmm. Roberts' character, just cannot, cannot keep his hand <laughs> out of the trap. Fuck, that's a great movie. Yeah. Oh, that is good. Well, we'll get a criterion edition of that somehow, someday. Yeah. And that, again, I'm going to try to pull it back to Dementis, but there's really no point. Like, we've already discussed exactly what his flaw is, but, but that's it. Like, it's somebody who seizes his moment and won't let it go. And then the minute he's like trapped, is like, you know, I'll fucking do anything. It's like it, it, he's got a. There's a lot of characters that sort of like are evolved versions of Richard the Third, just the, someone who's like started from low and just said, "Well, what if I told the boldest lie?" Which is very Trumpian, mm -hmm. I think. Like, what can I get away with? I remember thinking the most telling thing about Trump was that. Um, like in the middle of his first campaign back in 2016, he was calling his friends and saying, can you believe how well I'm doing? Like, I might win this thing. You know, it was like, that's fucking Richard. And I think Dementis has got a little bit of that in him. Like, let me see what I can get away with. And you want the girl, but I want this. Okay, all right, fine. You know. Yeah. And he's a terrible manager. Somebody pointed that out. And I think it might have even been. An awful manager. When he shoots his lieutenants, you know, uh, 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 uh boys off the truck to make it look real so that he can get in and he just he just looks over and goes what the fuck you expect me to do and then in the next chapter that's the rebel group that attacked the tanker yeah yeah you're right that's bad management <laughs> that's very bad management yeah i i think that's like this is almost like <laughs> this is almost like george miller's ted talk on how to be a good right. warlord just don't do this don't do this guy he's donnie don't yeah yeah very much so I have no idea how I'm going to get to this because I've been, I, or rather, I have had no idea how I was going to get to this because the podcast always closes with the same question, which is, is there anything of Furiosa that leached into the work that you've done? And is there something that you would want to carry forward? Is there an element of any of Miller's films that you could use as a, oh, like a guiding light? Like well, I like the complexity of his characters. I would love to play, you know, something that is conflicted and yet as transparent and yet as human. Uh, it's tremendous. It's just, um, but so much of what I like about Miller's films, maybe this speaks to me to more as a writer, is the way he he colors the corners obsessively and completely, and obviously thinking it through, and 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 just 
at a whim can add energy and fascination about the world where so other people just fall down by going big budget and going, yeah, the guess, you know, he's like, no, it's about the fucking way the, the, the bug is crawling up the guy's ear. It's like so much of his world is that perpetual first shot from uh, uh, once upon a time in the West where they're all just the fly is, but you know what I mean? It's yeah. just, it lives there. Another fav favorite director, Sergio Leone for me. Yeah. And another film about triangulation, right? Like it's about people taking stock of each other and making their move at the very last second oh, yeah. and making you wait for it. Maybe it was like Rob Steiger's character in in Duck You Sucker is an incredible opportunist. He might be he might be a Dementus Monquet, you know, because he's just like, what is this stuff? This this stuff you blows it up and it's a liquid. I gotta have it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, I haven't seen that in like ten since the DVD came out. I can watch that again. That was one of my first westerns ever, and it was just like I had to see it again. Yeah. I would be like watching Train Spotting as your first movie ever. I think like people don't give Leone credit for exactly how intense his movies are. Even now, like they hold up. Oh, they totally hold up. They totally hold up. And every generation deserves their version of it. I took my son to see Drive. Uh, and I realized he was so blown away by it. And I realized, oh, this is your taxi driver. You know? Yeah. 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 I wonder what Fury Have you seen was. hundreds and hundreds of beavers yet? I have. I actually just wrote about it a couple of weeks ago. And it's the best movie. It's maybe the movie of the year. Like, because that is the direction. If the business is going to save itself, it's got to go. Somebody in was it Minnesota? No, Wisconsin. Going out in the winter and just doing a perfectly obsessed story. Yeah. There, there you go. There's a Miller comparison. Yes. You know. Yeah, talking exactly. About, talking about world building. Because you kind of believe it and you're delighted. And, and it doesn't bother you that at the end, the Beavers are driving spaceships. But of course they are. No, you know? it's all about the natural escalation. And it's that Looney Tunes mentality, right? Where, of course, this is happening. Something else will happen next. And honestly, I did not believe halfway through that he could maintain it. It was one of those things where, like, there's no way this is a feature. How does this keep going? And it does. It does. It does. And I'm stunned that like, it's just not more like I keep finding people I, uh, that haven't heard of it. And I'm like, how, how does a comedy that good? Like, what is it? Is it just gets lost in the vortex between streaming and theaters or something like, yeah, well, they self-released if I remember correctly, or it got picked up after its initial run. And so mostly it just ended up on streaming. It's on Tubi now. So is it, really? it can oh. be watched for free, which is, which is great because, I don't think, I think that's the other problem is now it is really hard to get people to pay $10 or 15 or even four ninety nine to rent a movie that looks like that, that, that it pushes against the expectations of the audience because you cannot believe that this could possibly be any good. And either it's pushed through word of mouth, like you're doing right now, right. Uh, or it's just forgotten and then discovered 10 years later in a, you know, like a special edition or something. But yeah, it's, it's the worst thing about this current state of exhibition where people will not spend money on a theater ticket unless it's an IMAX event, right? Like if it's, and yeah. it used to be that the Marvel movies drove it. And now I'm not so sure they do, but Furiosa was supposed to be the savior of the summer box office. And then when it only made what 60 or 70 million, that was considered it's like, it's nobody goes to see movies anymore. It's just unless there's a hook, unless there's a reason to go in. And and it's horrifying that a sequel to like a prequel to the best Mad Max movie ever didn't pull in the fans. But I do think that yeah, I know. the backlash of I know. And, that, and that was that was frankly on the critics because they would just like, you know, because people they, they have access. You, you used to have to go and look up a review. And now it's like, oh, it's on Twitter. Oh, it's not good. Oh, OK, like something yeah. can die before it ever gets a chance. No, the worst thing about social media invading when I was a working critic was that you had to immediately pronounce a film on leaving the theater. Like it was expected of us. At TIFF, yeah. I would write my review, but I would also have to condense it to three sentences and put it out instantly on leaving the theater. And it's like, for a rave, it's great because it's, you know, The Shape of Water was a perfect example. It was just like, I could immediately tweet my reaction. And then because it was the premiere screening and there was a Q&A afterwards, I could just quote what was going on and give people a larger context of what the themes were and what people wanted to do with it. But if you only saw the first tweet and it was even four stars instead of five, that might disqualify it in people's minds and, and it never gets a chance. Yeah. And it's horrible. 
horrible. Yeah. The work that endures is it's immune to, you know, social media commentary. But I mean, I look at the stuff from the eighties and nineties that I grew up on, uh, well, grew up, I was already an adult, but the stuff that helped form my consciousness and some of it, honestly, some of it was the kids. I have to admit, I was there for a couple of tapings and at, there was nothing like the experience. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was there when um, when you all ruined Presumed Innocent and the experience of the audience <laughs> responding to that, because yeah. I had seen it and no one else had because I had just sure. seen the press screening. And feeling that ripple through, like that was that was a legitimately punk moment, I think. It was, I've never <laughs> been to a, <laughs> to a New York Dolls show, but that's what it felt like. The yeah. sense that you can do this, that this is legal. And only because someone invented it. Like that's, right. that's what Miller does. That's what, that's what art does. And you can't explain that. That's what hundreds of beavers does. Like no one had ever made that movie until they made that movie. And then it seems like, why didn't anyone make this movie? Exactly. It's, why didn't anyone look at a mascot costume and see the potential of that in a film? Like, I don't know where he, I'd be fascinated to find out where he got his experience. Like, is, did he come from mime or clown? He could have come from there, but I don't know. Yeah. I, I tr- anyway, go get, watch Hundreds of Beavers, best comedy of the year. It's a, It'll blow you away. Like the same time you looked at, uh, first time you looked at Tim Robinson, I think you should leave, you know, which I just found out apparently, the rumor has it that the reason he called the show is that uh, Lauren Michaels, the producer said, you know, because, you know, they, they do a calling at the end of every year. And he said, I'm not going to fire you, but I think you should leave. You know, I did not know that story. No. Yeah. Anyway, it's as good as that. It's it's as it's, it's, it's as impactful as that moment of seeing that first fifteen minute sketch show, and realizing first of all, fifteen minutes is perfect for this level of energy, and it can be this anarchic. Yeah. My thanks to Mark McKinney, whose latest film, Scare Shitless, makes its Toronto debut this Saturday, November twenty third, at the Blood in the Snow Film Festival, nine thirty p.m. at the Isabel Bader Theater. Tickets are still available at bloodinthesnow.ca. You should also check out his very entertaining CTV series, Mark McKinney Needs a Hobby, airing Saturday nights at 10.30 p.m. and streaming on the CTV app. Thanks also to Ingrid Hamilton. She knows what she did. You can follow Mark on Instagram at Mark underscore D McKinney, and you can find Furiosa on 4K and Blu-ray from Warner Home Entertainment and streaming on Crave in Canada and Max in the U.S. It's also available to rent or buy on various VOD services across North America. You can find me on Blue Sky at Norm Wilner, and you can find this podcast there at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at someoneelsesmovie.com. The first year of the show is still available for just 20 bucks at payhip.com slash Semcast. That's the first 52 episodes of Someone Else's Movie, 43 of which aren't currently available anywhere else. And check out my newsletter, Shiny Things, at shiny-things.ghost.io. I think you'll enjoy it. Our theme song is by The Last Year. If you like it or the show in general, please say so. Leave a review wherever you've been listening. Every little bit helps. It truly does. And check out the other shows on the Frequency Podcast Network while you're doing that. Stay safe. Watch movies. Wear a mask if you go out. Get the new booster as soon as you can. I'll see you next week. dietitian Abby Sharp and on my new podcast Bite Back with Abby Sharp I'll be dismantling the multi-billion dollar diet industry that keeps us in a cycle of self-loathing and food fear. Join me every Tuesday for expert interviews, engaging conversations and my signature science and sass to bust myths, correct misinformation and help you break free from diet culture for good. Listen for free on the Seeker app or wherever you get your podcasts.